This is Unit 5, Part 2. Uh, we covered previously the uh, anatomy of the respiratory system, and now we're going to talk about the physiology or function of uh, respiration uh, and uh, how it's regulated. Breathing. That's what you're familiar with. You do it all the time. Inspiration, you uh, have air flowing into your lungs and expiration, uh, air or gases uh, flow out of your lungs. And so we have inspiration followed by expiration, followed by inspiration, etc. This, of course, is pulmonary ventilation, the two phases of pulmonary ventilation. Now, <clears throat> respiratory uh, pressures are always described relative to atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure at sea level is one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury. It's the pressure uh, exerted by the air all around your body. Um, uh, it's essentially because of the height of the column of air above you, but it is pressing down because it's a gas. Liquids do the same, by the way. It'll press on all sides of you. So that's atmospheric pressure. And we ignore it completely when we talk about different pressures in the lungs because it's a constant uh, on your body um, wherever you are, but it's a constant at all times, so we can just uh, subtract it away from uh, the numbers that we uh, that are really uh, applicable. Negative respiratory pressure is less than an atmosphere, and then positive respiratory pressure is greater than one atmosphere. So if you have a negative number, that means it's uh, lower pressure than all around you, at least if you're at sea level, and if it's positive, then it's greater. In the thoracic cavity, you have two types of pressure. You have the intrapulmonary pressure. That's the pressure within the space of the lungs within the alveoli, and that is abbreviated as P capital P and uh, subscript PUL. Then there's the intrapleural pressure, the pressure within the pleural cavity. Remember that the pleural cavity exists between the two serosal membranes of the pleural cavities, the left and right pleural cavities. So it's between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura which is a small space, but nevertheless is a space, and which normally is actually just filled with uh, fluid, serosal fluid. <clears throat> so these two pressures, the pulmonary pressure, sorry, the intrapulmonary pressure and the intrapleural pressure will always change, vary with which phase of breathing is going on. Um, uh, inspiration or expiration, and it changes during inspiration, it changes during expiration. The intrapulmonary pressure always eventually will equalize itself to atmospheric pressure because when your mouth is open and your uh, epiglottis is open, then your lungs are in are connected directly to the atmosphere around you, and therefore uh, it will equalize. You know, if this is the lung and this is the trachea, and your mouth is open, if the pressure in here is positive, that means higher than atmospheric then, and all your airways are open, then what you will get is flow of air outwards until the two pressures are equal and not positive or greater inside. So when the two are equal, it equalizes. Similarly, if uh, these are your lungs, this is your trachea, there's your mouth or nose, 
and um, if the pressure inside your lungs is uh, negative, less than atmospheric, then air will flow inwards until <clears throat> it's equal to the atmospheric. It'll keep flowing until it eventually equalizes with the atmosphere. Overall, when you look at the intrapleural pressure, intrapleural pressure is always, always less than the intrapulmonary pressure and the atmospheric pressure. It's always less. It needs to be less than the intrapulmonary pressure because it's actually that difference that holds the lungs up against the inner walls. Now, there are two major forces acting to pull the lungs away from the walls or the thoracic wall. In other words, two major forces that promote lung collapse. One is the elastic nature of the lungs, which causes them to assume the smallest possible size. You know, I showed you all those uh, small elastic fibers that are present surrounding the alveoli. And the other <clears throat> is a surface tension of the fluid inside the alveoli, which tends to draw it closed to the smallest possible size, pulling it shut. Remember, surface tension uh, is overcome to a large extent by surfactant, but not all of it is, and <clears throat> tends to close it. Just like the, a, plas a thin, very thin plastic bag would, if you wet the surface inside, would tend to close on itself um, uh, and exclude the air as the surface tension of the water pulls it together. <coughs> The opposing force is the elasticity of the chest wall, which pulls the thorax outward and helps uh, when you're uh, breathing to enlarge the space of the thoracic cavity. And so here we see it. The intrapulmonary pressure is in here and the intra Pleural pressure is in this space in here between the pleura. The <clears throat> difference uh, typically, um, remember <clears throat> zero means it's the intrapulmonary pressure is equivalent to atmospheric. Uh, of course, the atmosphere around us is at 760. We're ignoring whenever we talk about intrapulmonary or whatever pressures in the lungs, the thoracic cavity, we ignore or subtract away the atmospheric pressure. So intrapulmonary pressure <coughs> uh, when there's no airflow is zero. The um, intrapleural pressure is always uh, lower than the intrapulmonary. What will cause the lungs to collapse? The lungs can actually collapse. They can collapse away from the wall of the, of the uh, uh, thoracic cavity, of the right and left pleural cavities of the thoracic cavity, if the intrapleural pressure equalizes the intrapulmonary. This is uh, the difference between the two, of course, is the transpulmonary pressure. I already told you that it's the difference between the two that helps to keep your uh, airways and lungs open. So the difference between these two, which is always needs to be a positive value, is the transpulmonary pressure, intrapulmonary minus intrapleural. <clears throat> okay, when you breathe, you are uh, carrying out a mechanical process uh, mediated by voluntary skeletal muscles uh, that all depends on volume changes uh, that you are making in the thoracic cavity and those volume changes cause changes in pressure. So you get a you you uh, with your muscles cause a volume change that leads to pressure changes and if there's a difference between uh, 
the intrapulmonary pressure and the atmospheric pressure, then you will get flow, when your airways are open, you will get flow of gases to equalize that. As I told you before, <clears throat> if the intrapulmonary is higher than atmospheric and your airways open, it'll air will flow out. And if it's lower than atmospheric air will, and your airways open, air will flow in. Now, let's go to the much loved Boyle's law, which you've learned before. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. P1 V2 equals P2 V2. It's the uh, relationship between pressure and volume of gases in two different compartments. Uh, and pressure will change as volume changes. But the P1 V1 of one compartment, if it's connected to the other, will equal the P2 V2 of the other. Um, did I say the other compartment? I meant <clears throat> the other uh, condition. Uh, as the volume of the space changes, so when your lungs are empty, you have a smaller volume. Um, well, let, let's go to the example on the next page. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So for inspiration, <clears throat> what you want is that, remember P1 V1 equals P2 V2. What you do when you inspire to uh, ventilate your lungs is that you contract the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. Intercostal muscles, that means between the ribs. You have an external layer and internal, you are contracting the external layer. What that causes is the rib cage to rise. And it's missing here actually, the rib cage rises and if this is a di if this is a drawing of the diaphragm here, the only what direction that the or movement that you can have with the diaphragm if it contracts is it gets shorter and then it has to descend. Okay. So the diaphragm, which is dome shaped and separates the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity, will descend. As a result of the rib cage rising and the diaphragm descending, the lungs, the volume of the lungs will rise. Okay, the intrapulmonary volume increases. So now instead of um, instead of uh, V1, it's changed to V2. Okay, so the volume V2 has gone up. That's the change in that one compartment. Well, if P1 V1 equals P2 V2, <clears throat> if the volume has gone up, and I'm going to put an arrow up, then the pressure will have to have gone down in order that P2 times V2 still equals P1 V1, the original P1 V1. So as a result of the volume increases, uh, intrapulmonary pressure will drop below the atmospheric and air will, as long as your airway is open, air will flow into the lungs down the pressure gradient from high pressure to low pressure. And that airflow will stop flowing when you get equilibration or equalization between the intrapulmonary and the atmospheric. So this inspiration is the active part of breathing or inspiration at rest. Okay. Now, all of this that I've described and explained is shown on this table from your textbook. Let's go now to, and so it's reviewed here, but there's nothing new uh, or different. So now let's go to 
this, these graphs that show uh, what is happening during inspiration. During inspiration, which is on the left-hand side of both graphs, you are contracting muscles, the respiratory, major respiratory muscles at rest, the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. And what happens is you are increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity as a result of that intrapulmonary pressure drops below atmospheric, so below what we consider zero, and airflow is, air is flowing in. What is the volume? This is volume of air flowing in. It's uh, in this case, this much from there to there. The average, uh, you know, what's called tidal volume. It's about a half a liter. Um, meanwhile, you have also, at the same time, by the way, dropped the intrapleural pressure. The intrapleural pressure is always less than the intrapulmonary pressure. So there's always this uh, difference between the two. The transpulmonary pressure is always present, uh, and it's the intrapulmonary minus the intrapleural. So it's always has to be some sort of positive value. That's what helps hold the lungs up against the wall. You're rising, raising the thoracic cage outwards by contracting muscles and the muscles between the ribs and dropping the diaphragm down causes the volume of this space to increase and the intrapleural pressure to drop and therefore the intrapulmonary pressure to drop also and you get inspiration. Expiration, those inspiratory muscles relax, the rib cage drops, so your chest drops somewhat, the thoracic cavity volume will decrease, ah, the diaphragm rises, that's missing in here, you can put diaphragm rises, thoracic cavity volume will decrease. P1 V1 equals P2 V2, if the volume goes down, the pressure has to go up. <clears throat> the elastic lungs also recoil uh, and as I said, if the pressure goes down, uh, if the, uh, I'm sorry, if the volume goes down, the pressure uh, must go up. Intrapulmonary pressure does rise. It rises above the atmospheric and you get flow of gases out of the lungs down the pressure gradient, meaning from high to low. It's always, if there's a difference, if there's a gradient, Pressure flow of fluids or air uh, of gases is uh, from high to low. So gases flow out again until the two equilibrate, intrapulmonary and atmospheric. And this is again all summarized here on this table. And so we covered inspiration on this side because you increased the volume and therefore dropped the pressure, both intrapleural and uh, intrapulmonary and with expiration you made the volume smaller and uh, the volume of the thoracic cavity smaller and therefore raise the intrapulmonary and transpulmonary pressures and as air flows in the, the, that you know that eventually equilibrates to atmospheric value here and flow stops. Flow will stop whenever it uh, equals uh, intrapulmonary equals atmospheric. And so you breathe out about half a liter if you're, this is a, a tidal breathing, breathing at rest. And that's it. That's ventilation, inspiration, followed by expiration, and then inspiration, expiration, etc. There are physical factors that influence uh, ventilation and the uh, a very important one, of course, is resistance, resistance to flow. The major non-elastic uh, source of resistance to airflow is friction. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's the major source of uh, resistance to flow is friction. The relationship is uh, that flow is equal to 
uh, delta P. I already told you that the delta refers to the difference or change in pressure. <clears throat> Flow goes up as pressure uh, rises, uh, as the pressure change or difference is higher and flow goes down if the pressure difference, you can call it gradient, uh, is lower. And resistance has a inverse effect. The lower the resistance, the higher the rate of flow, the, uh, or the greater the flow, the lower the, uh, the lower the resistance, the greater the flow, the higher the resistance, the greater the flow. Um, I'm sorry. The lower the resistance, the greater the flow, the higher the resistance, the less flow, because it's an inverse relationship. So flow is equal to delta P over R, where R is resistance, delta P is the uh, change or difference in pressure between uh, before and after uh, when you make a change with inspiration and expiration. So, <clears throat> as I said earlier, its flow is directly proportional to delta P, the gradient between the atmosphere and the alveoli, and inversely proportional to resistance. Um, the greatest resistance is actually in the, not in the smallest, narrowest bronchi, which you might expect, but in the medium-sized bronchi, because you have to consider the total cross-sectional area. You know, if you have a trachea going down and then you have narrower uh, primary bronchi, uh, it's not just that they're narrower, and narrow, of course, causes an increase in resistance to flow, but there's also a certain total sum cross-sectional area, and you have to take th that into consideration. The medium-sized bronchi will have overall the, the, the smallest uh, total uh, cross-sectional area, and therefore that's where the resistance is highest. And here you see that uh, resistance and uh, airway generation, airway generation is the, you know, uh, stage of uh, branching as they branch into the, the primary bronchi, there are two branches there uh, from the from the trachea, and they're branching, and then they branch and branch and branch until you have 23 total branchings. Um, this is uh, referring to the conducting zone, which goes all the way down to the terminal bronchioles, and then there's the respiratory zone, which goes from the respiratory bronchioles to the alveoli, and uh, resistance is highest. Uh, within the medium-sized uh, bronchi. So, as airway resistance rises, breathing has to become more strenuous. And, of course, there are situations where that can happen. Uh, if you have severely constricted bronchioles because of um, uh, the smooth muscle around the bronchioles has contracted, or if you have obstructed bronchioles, that's also a problem. It also narrows it. Obstruction could be uh, mucus or accumulation of fluids um, so that you can't get proper flow. So constriction, narrowing, or obstruction are both problems and can prevent adequate or even life-sustaining uh, ventilation. And that can occur, for example, during an acute asthma attack, which can actually prevent proper ventilation. It can, uh, you get with uh, acute asthma attacks, you get uh, contraction of uh, smooth muscle around the airways. Um, and also you get um, uh, increased uh, mucus production. Uh, there is a neurotransmitter, which is also used as a drug, it's manufactured and used as a drug, called epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, which I've talked to you before. It gets released by the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, so the sympathetic nervous system can release epinephrine, and that helps to dilate bronchioles because it relaxes the smooth muscle around them. 
and therefore reduces airway resistance. And for that reason, um, you know, the, the body is designed uh, when you're uh, in this kind of fight or flight uh, situation, you have increased activity of the sympathetic nervous system. I remind you that the autonomic, autonomic nervous system is the one that controls involuntary tissues like smooth muscle and that there are two divisions. There is the sympathetic nervous system or sympathetic division and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic is when you are in a fight or flight situation. It's the sympathetic is that and the parasympathetic is when you are in a, a relaxed uh, situation. So you have increased sympathetic, then you'll get widening of the airways because the smooth muscle around them are, is relaxed and therefore they dilate, they get, the bronchioles dilate, they get wider because the smooth muscle is not contracting and causing them to narrow. And that reduces airway resistance. So you can take in more air because typically when you're in this fight or flight mode, you do breathe more, you do need more oxygen. The body's uh, geared up or gearing up to, to uh, generate more energy and needs more energy. That's um, what's abnormal in a asthma attack is that, uh, and, and the neurotransmitter released from the sympathetic nervous system is epinephrine that causes the, directly causes the smooth muscle to relax. This is why uh, when someone has an asthma attack, they take, uh, they breathe in, uh, they have a ventilator uh, that dispenses um, a drug which is similar to, not exactly the same, but similar to epinephrine. It has epinephrine-like effects and that helps uh, relax the um, uh, smooth muscle around their bronchioles and the uh, bronchioles widen or dilate and they can breathe easier. And it's also why their heart will beat a little faster because the response of the heart to epinephrine or adrenaline is, or the drug, which is epinephrine-like, has epinephrine-like activity is, uh, you know, the effect of the heart uh, is on the heart is to speed it up. Again, a sympathetic response, which we'll talk about during, when we do cardiovascular system it causes uh, dilation of the bronchioles and increased heart rate. Another thing that helps you perform more strenuous activity, increased heart rate. Okay. Again, let's talk about, uh, remember we're talking about resistance and surface tension, uh, which are the two big things that uh, uh, reduce uh, or resist uh, flow. Uh, increased resistance, um, narrowing of uh, airways or uh, surface tension of fluid in the alveoli. Surface tension is the attraction of water molecules to one another. At the liquid gas interface, you have that kind of tension, which is why insects, some insects, tiny insects can actually walk on the water. They don't sink in. And the water that coats the inner surface of the alveoli always wants to try and reduce the alveoli to cause them to collapse in on themselves. But luckily we have type 2 cells in the alveolar wall which secretes surfactant, a detergent-like molecule that helps to reduce surface tension, keep them from collapsing. Okay, now <clears throat> in terms of um, uh, the stretching out and uh, recoiling of lungs like a, you know an elastic band in physiology we do not uh, consider it in those terms in fact what we always talk about uh, in respiratory physiology is lung compliance now what lung compliance is is the ease with which the lungs can be expanded so you know how much um, effort is required to expand the lungs and I can tell you that uh, there is a possible range uh, of compliance values and uh, it is not a question of very high compliance being good or very low compliance being good. Very 
easy ability to expand the lungs is not uh, a good situation and very uh, a, lo a lot of difficulty in expanding lungs is not good. There is a sweet zone or Goldilocks zone um, that is uh, ideal and uh, is is the norm or the normal values. So compliance really is the measure and change of lung volume that will occur with uh, any with a given change in transpulmonary pressure. Remember, the transpulmonary pressure is the difference between the intrapulmonary and intra, intra pleural pressures. So, um, if you uh, contract your inspiratory muscles, for example, uh, you are generating a positive transpulmonary pressure. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you contract your inspire inspiratory muscles, then you are uh, increasing the volume of the lungs and lowering the uh, uh, both the intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressures. So you have that transpulmonary pressure. Um, and it's a question of uh, how much change in lung volume will occur with that change in transpulmonary pressure. Um, the key thing is really, um, how much effort has to go into uh, changing lung volume. So what is the ease with which lungs can be expanded? How much effort has to go into that? It is determined by two main factors. Compliance is determined by two main factors. The nature of the lung tissue, the distensibility of the lung tissue itself, and the surrounding thoracic cage and the surface tension in the alveoli, all of the alveoli together. So if it takes very, very, very little effort to expand your lungs, it sounds like that's good. You know, I don't have to work too hard. My inspiratory muscles don't have to contract too hard to expand my lungs. That sounds like a good thing. Uh, air will flow in. Yes, air will flow in very easily, but now try to breathe out and see how difficult it is. Okay, so people with very high lung compliance can breathe in easily, but they cannot breathe out very easily. And people with very low compliance, in other words, very difficult to, to expand their lungs, uh, they have trouble breathing in. Okay. So, <clears throat> what factors, in fact, do diminish or change, reduce lung compliance, the ease of... Uh, of uh, expanding your lungs well scar tissue in, in you know whenever you injure any tissue you get scar tissue what scar tissue is is uh, uh, a part of the wound healing process you get an increase in fibroblasts at the site and the fibroblasts secrete um, collagen and the collagen will hold together you know will replace the damaged tissue and hold the cells around in that air, damaged area together. That is, if it's uh, excessive, it's called fibrosis and it reduces the natural uh, resilience or you know compliance of the lungs. So scar tissue is not good. It's, it's what you get when you have a scar forming, when, the, when you have a cut after it, the cut is healed, sometimes you have a scar, that is uh, accumulation of collagen. The collagen holds together the tissue after that uh, damage. The other thing that will reduce the ease of expansion of the lungs or lung compliance is obstruction or blockage of the respiratory passages. That can be with mucus or uh, other types of fluid. You can have uh, interstitial fluid flowing into the area. Um, or a reduction in production of surfactant that will also diminish lung compliance. Or decreased flexibility of the thoracic cage, a change in its ability to stretch when you uh, um, contract the inspiratory muscles. All of these make things more difficult, make breathing more difficult. Uh, examples are deformities of the thorax, uh, 
uh, calcification or ossification of the uh, cartilage that's attached to the ribs, the costal cartilage. Uh, if that becomes uh, ossified, more calcium is deposited in it, it will become stiffer, not as easily uh, expanded. Or paralysis of the intra intercostal muscles can also reduce lung compliance. All of these are examples of those situations. Now this diagram, this is a diagram of uh, pulmonary function. Uh, uh, when we're looking at respiration, when a person's respiration is tested, they do pulmonary function tests. And pulmonary function tests will uh, examine different key volumes and with those volumes we also these are all different volumes they'll measure they measure different volumes that you have uh, and I'll explain that soon enough and that uh, those are also expressed in terms of capacities and uh, you need to learn these uh, the thing is, I'll go through it on this graph, but we'll go through it also in the next few slides. Um, <clears throat> when you're breathing at rest, the volume of air that you're uh, taking in and putting out. And now these graphs, by the way, as you see here, you have a, you know, you have this uh, graph like this. The values are going along like that. And by uh, convention and uh, ease of understanding it, uh, a deflection upwards is an increase in volume and a deflection downwards is a decrease. And that, of course, is in fact uh, shown in the, uh, in the scale here on this side. So up is inspiration and down is expiration, right? So you're inspired, it goes upwards, deflects upwards, you, ex uh, you exhale or expiration goes downwards. And when you're breathing in and out at rest, that is called uh, tidal breathing. And the volume that you breathe in is on average about 500 mLs. So this tidal breathing is occurring here, in and out, and in and out. And you are breathing normally, and if you think about it, it should make sense to you, you are normally breathing not at the upper end of your volume, potential held volume, but in a comfortable sort of mid-range uh, area. It's not like your lungs are almost full and then you add another 500, they're completely full, and then you breathe out 500 and you're, it's not as if you are breathing up here in this, sorry, in this area here, okay? You are breathing down here, you're doing tidal breathing, and that 500 mLs, approximately 500 mLs, this is for an average male, um, that 500 mLs is uh, what's called the tidal volume. Okay, tidal volume. <clears throat> 500 mLs. Now, you also know by, uh, you know, common sense also tells you that it, uh, you can think, uh, you should be able to realize that uh, you also have uh, a reserve volume that you can use for breathing. You can breathe in more than the tidal volume. And in fact, the inspira inspiratory volume above tidal volume is called the inspiratory reserve volume. And it can be about three liters, uh, as much as three liters. So this is uh, this volume here that you can still breathe in even at the top, once you reach the top of uh, inspiratory uh, uh, tidal volume, you can still breathe in more if you need to. And of course, often we do when we're going to run, for example, or are very active. We need to take in more air so we have more oxygen so that we can generate more energy uh, in the electron transport chain, the ATP, remember, 
where oxygen is the final electron, except we want more air. And we have that inspiratory reserve volume, about three liters. So that is, this is tidal volume, TV. This is inspiratory reserve volume, IRV. And when we breathe out and get to the bottom of the normal tidal volume, there is still more that we could breathe out, and that is called expiratory reserve volume, or ERV. And ERV can be, you know, 1, 1 1.2 liters. Uh, we are already at around almost 5 liters if you look at the vital capacity. And vital capacity is IRV plus TV plus ERV. So when you're really breathing uh, hard, uh, and um, that's when you're typically exercising, you are using a large part of your vital capacity up to as much as maybe five liters. <clears throat> Certainly, um, even the smallest uh, adult would have uh, close to four. Let's say at the lowest end for a really small petite person, three and a half, but it's quite a big volume. So you can really increase how much ventilation uh, you have ongoing in your lungs by putting in an effort and breathing and using the inspiratory capacity and, and the, um, or inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume and thus use that uh, vital capacity that you have. Uh, there is always a residual volume in the lungs due to some areas that aren't being used uh, completely or the um, conducting zone that has its own volume uh, but is not uh, part of the functional uh, uh, volume of the lungs uh, being used. It's not being used for respiration, it's just a volume in that uh, passageway. Okay. Each of the volumes and capacities that I discussed are here again, explained there once again. Uh, respiratory volumes, as I said, include tidal volume, the amount you move in and out of your lungs uh, with uh, breathing at rest, inspiratory or IRV, which is above that, uh, ERV, which is uh, uh, below that. Uh, that you can breathe out after you've uh, done a tight, you've gotten to the bottom of tidal volume, or after at the end of the tidal volume, you can still breathe out uh, more. And residual volume, any air left in the lungs uh, after you breathe out as much as you can. There's always a volume left because not all the airways collapse. So, uh, get familiar and comfortable with these terms. It's, uh, it's uh, how we talk about, uh, we always talk about breathing in these uh, terms. The capacities are inspiratory capacity, which as I told you is uh, IRV plus TV. Uh, functional residual capacity is everything else. Uh, I don't know why they call it functional because the residual volume, well, people talk quite a bit uh, often about vital capacity. That's a useful VC, vital capacity. And I told you it can be uh, even the smallest person, three and a half uh, liters in a reasonable size adult uh, male, uh, five liters. I've seen it up to higher than that. That's the working uh, volume of air that you're getting into your lungs. Uh, and the entire total is everything IRV plus TV plus ERV plus RV, etc. Now we also talk about dead space and I've sort of talked about it a, a little, uh, somewhat. There's anatomical dead space, volume of the conducting respiratory passages. Uh, remember, you know, uh, when you breathe out, your alveoli do not collapse. They do not close completely. And so you do have uh, a, um, uh, you do have some 
uh, residual volume. And uh, you also, and I left that out, it, the, the, the alveoli do not collapse. So you do have a reasonable residual volume afterwards. And uh, you also have the conducting respiratory passages that contribute to it. You could also have um, um, some dead space where the alveoli are not, uh, they're, they're obstructed, so they're not uh, involved in ventilation. So the total sum of dead space is alveolar and anatomical dead space, and that's space that is not used to exchange gas at all. PFT, I told you, is a pulmonary function tests, and it's done using a spirometer. And we will, I believe, do that in the lab. And the spirometer or spirometry measurements can distinguish between two major types of uh, disease processes, classes of disease processes, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, where you have uh, the common thread is they are all involved in increase in airway resistance or restrictive disorders where you have a reduction in the total lung capacity uh, because of structural or functional changes in the lungs. So you can have restricted, restrictive disease or obstructive disease. Obstructing, obstructive pulmonary disease is obstruction to flow due to increased airway resistance. Restrictive is uh, you actually have a change in lung capacity. Total ventilation is uh, the volume of gas that goes in and out of the respiratory tract over a, a, a fixed amount of time, uh, the uh, typically a minute. So your total ventilation is the total volume that goes in and out uh, per minute. Forced vital capacity is how much you can expel after taking the deepest breath possible. So you get up to the top of inspiratory reserve volume, IRV, and then you breathe out as much as you possibly can. The largest volume, that is forced vital capacity. That's what they ask you to do when they do pulmonary function tests. Besides looking at regular tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume, going back to tidal volume or expiratory reserve volume, going back to tidal volume. They also ask you to breathe in as much as you can and then breathe out the biggest possible volume you can. Okay, that's a typical kind of test that is uh, done in pulmonary function test, forced vital capacity. Uh, <clears throat> Now, force vital capacity is, you know, how much can you breathe out? It's not doesn't have a time frame to it. If there's a time component, that is then called the forced expiratory volume or FEV. And quite often, actually, you hear about FEV1, which is the how much volume you can expel in once in the first second of breathing out. Forced expiratory volume is the amount of gas that you can ex or exhale or ex expirate during expiration uh, during a specific time. So you're doing, you're carrying out this kind of forced uh, breathing outwards and uh, you have a, and they, they'll, they'll look at it over a certain period of time. You, often the first second from the top of IRV, right? We have tidal volume, IRV, Tidal volume, ERV, and they'll ask you to breathe in as much as you can and then breathe out as much as you can. And people, you know, they breathe out and uh, they're breathing out and then they, you know, they, they sort of their effort slows down a little, but if you coax them, they can still breathe out a little bit more. And we often look at it over a time frame. So if this is time, then they'll typically take the first second. What volume can be breathed out in the first second? This is volume, this is time. All right, 
Okay. So changes that occur in obstructive disease typically involve increases in these values, the total lung capacity. You know, it's obstruction. It's due to um, uh, reduced uh, flow because of an increase in uh, resistance, obstruction to flow. Uh, so you have um, something that's, uh, you know, narrowing of the airways, uh, maybe because of uh, contraction of smooth muscle or uh, buildup of some uh, mucus. Uh, but you have or uh, a reduced uh, um, uh, increased um, surface tension could also do that. But uh, obstructive disease causes increases in total lung capacity, functional uh, residual capacity and, and uh, residual volumes, whereas restrictive disease uh, can cause reductions in, in these. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't worry too much about these terms and uh, these values in terms of which disease is which. I would know that diseases associated with obstruction or restriction that I've talked about, but I wouldn't worry about increases or decreases with these. It's uh, more than you really uh, require, or would be required to know. Let's talk about alveolar ventilation. It's extremely important. The alveolar ventilation rate is the flow, uh, a measure of the flow in and out of the alveoli over a particular time period. So uh, we're talking about alveolar ventilation rate. It's a frequency. We're talking about breaths per minute. The units are breaths per minute. And uh, the volume that we're interested in is uh, tidal volume minus the volume of dead space. So that's a volume mils, milliliters per breath. And so the uh, actual values, because the breath part gets canceled, it's milliliters per minute alveolar ventilation rate. Okay. If you breathe slow and deep, that will increase the alveolar ventilation rate. You are increasing the ventilation in your alveoli. And the alveoli is where is the place where it counts in your lungs. If you breathe a shallow, a small uh, tidal volume and rapidly, you will decrease the alveolar ventilation rate because too much is in the moving up and down in the dead space too much of the total uh, volume of each breath. You know, if you're breathing in rapidly in small volumes and you could try it, <laughs> panting, <laughs> you're not ventilating your alveoli well, you're just moving a smaller volume up and down mostly within your debt space, that's not good. Okay, now uh, we should consider uh, when we talk about alveolar ventilation, uh, the reason we talk about it is because uh, you have to consider the importance of uh, that in uh, effective breathing. Normally, when you breathe, you uh, take in 500 mils and breathe out 500 mils. That's your tidal volume. That's normal breathing at rest. Of that 500, about 30% of it is moving air in the dead space. Uh, you know, air that's volume that's in the dead space that's not acting. Uh, physiologically, it's just in that space which is not involved in gas exchange. So, you know, your trachea, your con it's your conducting zone. If you're and at rest, to normal breathing, you're breathing about 20 per minute. So you're breathing in and out 20 times a minute and 500 mils each time. That's 10 liters or 10,000 mils per minute. Now, of that, 30% of it uh, here is dead space. So what percent of the tidal volume is dead space? 30%. Therefore, your alveolar ventilation is 7 mils per minute. So that's the alveolar ventilation rate per minute. It's 
Did I say seven mils? Seven liters, 7,000 milliliters. However, if you change the rate and depth of your breathing, if you breathe slower and deeper, and that example is shown here, the dead space volume still is the same, but now the tidal volume, if you doubled the tidal volume to a thousand and you have the respiration rate, which is not actually that unreasonable, people can do that fairly easily, then the minute ventilation rate is still 10 times a hundred, uh, 10 times a thousand, which is 10,000 mils per minute, no difference between these two. However, the percent of the tidal volume that's in the dead space has dropped to 15%. 10 times 150 is 1,500. So you have to subtract 1,500 from the 10,000 and you're left with just 15% that's in the dead space. And therefore you are ventilating your alveoli much better. You've gone from 7,000 AVR to 8,500 AVR per minute. A person who is rapidly breathing, very shallow, so they are breathing half the normal. These are just values, you know, we've taken simple multiples or fractions of the normal 500. So here a half of the normal tidal volume and double the normal respiration rate. So the person's breathing rapidly and shallow. Minute ventilation, no different but there's a big difference in alveolar ventilation rate because the tide percent tidal volume, 40 times 250, um, the percent tidal volume that is dead space has gone up and therefore alveolar ventilation rate is only 4,000 mils per minute and it's much less effective. So there can be a huge difference between slow deep breathing and rapid shallow breathing. A lot of people who uh, start running initially breathe too fast and too rapidly and they're one of the classic things that they're told is run uh, when you're breathe slow and deeper slower and deeper don't increase your breathing it doesn't help it only tires you out and fatigues you and doesn't ventilate your lungs as well as a slow deep breathing there are all kinds of non-respiratory anything that's not breathing is just a non-respiratory air movement it's typically the result of some sort of reflex all of these anything huffing puffing coughing sneezing gasping whatever okay and now we get to Dalton's law we talked about Boyle's law p1 v1 equals p2 v2 and now let's talk about Dalton's law the total pressure exerted by a gas is, uh, you know, if you have a single gas, then you look at that pressure. But if you have a mixture of gases, as you do with air, because you have in air, you have nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, you have all those gases mixed together. In a mixture of gases, the sum of each individual pressure exerted by each one independently of the other, the sum will be the uh, uh, total, the total pressure of the air is the sum of them. They are acting independently. So it's the sum of each pressure uh, in, of each in gas, uh, separate gas, that is the total pressure. So you have to add each one up. So the partial pressure of each gas will be directly proportional to its percentage in the mix. Okay, so if you have 80% nitrogen, it's the partial pressure of nitrogen, you know, 20% oxygen is the partial pressure that's key that you have to consider. Uh, that's Dalton's law of partial pressures, which you probably have heard about before, I would think. Normally, at atmospheric, uh, uh, at sea level, uh, the atmospheric pressure, as you know, is 760. That's the sum total of all the different pressures. And the, each one has to be considered individually. Nitrogen is close to 80%. Oxygen is close to 20%. Oxygen is a little bit higher, but closer to 21, but nitrogen is lower. There's a small amount of CO2 in the air around us. 
Um, and there is water vapor, and that total is 100% of the uh, total pressure, 760. But we have to consider the fact that uh, once you get into the alveoli, things are different. In the inside the lungs, there's, you know, we have to look at each gas. And, and, and when you look at the gas, oxygen, it's being taken up by the, it's diffusing out of the space of the alveoli into the blood. And so it is lower than atmospheric. CO2 is diffusing outwards from the blood into the alveolar space, so it is much higher than atmospheric. It is 100% humidified in the lungs, so you have a lot of water vapor, that's water in gas, gaseous form. And all of that, uh, it has to all add up to 100%, so the percentage of nitrogen is lower than what you have in atmospheric. End result is that in the alveoli, you have a, a partial pressure of oxygen of 104, and a partial pressure of CO2 of 40. And partial pressures are shown uh, as a P with a subscript and the gas. So we have PO2 and we have PCO2, uh, PCO2, partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of CO2. In the alveolar space, it's 104. Uh, for oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen 104 in the alveoli, and partial pressure of CO2 is 40. And that's the end of Unit 5, Part 2.